All right, gang, here we go. Have a great conversation. It's time for Tycoons of Small Biz, spotlighting the true backbone of the American economy, the true tycoons of business in America, the owners, founders, and CEOs of small businesses. Backbone Financial, the show's sponsor, is a marketing name for business conducted through Lincoln Financial Advisors Corporation, a broker-dealer, member SIPC, and registered investment advisor. The views expressed by your host, Austin L. Peterson, are not necessarily the views of Lincoln Financial Advisors. Now let's lean in as Austin connects with this week's Tycoons. Good afternoon, Tycoons, and welcome to Tycoons of Small Biz. This, uh, this week, I'm going to take the chance to introduce the show a little bit more. Uh, we did have some great guests on last week, but wanted to just kind of lay out a little bit as to why we've decided to launch this program, and I'm going to introduce a co-host as well that wasn't with us last week due to uh, some new twins entering his life. So. We'll get to that in just a second, but uh, Tycoons of Small Biz, as the intro said, is a program about small business, and we thought that this was the perfect time to launch this program given the effects of COVID-19 and how it's affecting small businesses throughout the country, and thought, you know what, that this is the time. We've thought about doing this for a while, but now's the time to kind of lean in and, and say, you know, what, what can we do to help small businesses throughout the country to get some marketing to get some some information out there so that everybody can can go and you know shop local so to speak and support these businesses do everything that we can there so uh, we hope you enjoy the program and thanks for listening I'm going to introduce uh, our co-host Landon Mance so Landon Mance and I have been working together we're both financial advisors with Lincoln Financial Advisors as you heard in that long very informative uh, intro but uh, Landon is in Las Vegas, and he and I own our own practices, but we work together with many clients, uh, specifically business owners, to help them with their financial planning needs. So Landon, if you want to quickly introduce yourself, tell us a, a little bit about yourself, and then we'll, we'll jump into the, to today's guest. Sure. Absolutely. Appreciate it. Yeah, my name's Landon Mance. Like Austin said, I'm out in Las Vegas. And uh, I, I've been off the map quite a bit uh, the last uh, three weeks as of Saturday. My wife and I had twins. And uh, Hendrix and Harper came into our lives, and we are just uh, overjoyed and uh, just beyond excited. They're spending a little bit of time right now in the hospital, just getting a little bit of extra help with a few things, but making really great progress every day. And we expect them to be home uh, middle um, end of May at the latest. So um, that time couldn't come come fast enough. But yeah, I've been in practice for about a decade. And like Austin said, we, we focus primarily on serving uh, private business owners, their management teams, and their employees um, in a lot of different areas. But primarily, we focus on, on doing a succession and exit planning uh, for the business owners themselves. Uh, working with their management team with, uh, you know, retention type strategies, things similar to that. And then we do all their personal financial planning as well. So that's kind of what kind of our, our focus, but uh, really excited to be here and really excited to spend some time uh, getting to know Preston and hearing his story. Yeah, thanks, Landon. We're excited to have you back here and we're glad that the, that Harper and Hendricks are doing well and everything is uh, on the up and up, so to speak. So it's, it gets Appreciate it. A little scary uh, when they're preemies like that, but we're, we're glad that everything's going well. So let's jump over to Preston Weeks. Uh, Preston is this week's tycoon here in the, uh, in the studio, and we wanted to have him in and have him tell a little bit about himself and his story. And he's got a, a very interesting background. I'm excited to, to hear his story and the different things that he's done over his career thus far and where he sees things going in the future. But Preston, why don't you just tell us a little bit about your family, yourself, you know, your background, and then we'll jump into some questions about what you've done as a tycoon. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate it. And I appreciate you guys having me here. And I, I want to say, I really love what you're doing because, you know, standing for people, standing for the business and the small business and you know, making sure these businesses succeed. I have a lot to do with, you know, what my core values are in, in business as well. So it lines perfectly, but I as, I as well have twins 
Uh, so yeah, you're on an adventure, Landon, but it's it's the most amazing thing ever. I've got I've got that my twins are turning six, and I've got an eight year old uh, boy girl twins and a, a boy that's eight, and they're just absolutely the joy of my life. And so, and I've got a beautiful wife named Brooke, and uh, she supports me through all my crazy business endeavors, and has been along this ride with me. But yeah, I mean a, li- a little bit about my background. I'm a car nut. I have been since I was a baby since I was two years old. And so you know, I'd ride around back when kids didn't have to uh, go in, in car seats and things like that. I'd ride on the bump. <laughs> I called it the bump. It was an armrest of my dad's Cadillac. And he'd have contests to see who could name the oncoming car faster, if I could name it or if his friends in the car could name it. And usually I'd win. And so you know, that, that brought me into the car industry. And from there, you know, I've, I've been a serial entrepreneur, I guess you could say. I've started you know, quite a few businesses. I've been involved in a lot of different businesses, and you know we can talk more about that. But I just, I just love entrepreneurship, starting businesses, growing businesses, and and now you know, creating solutions for people to try to do that. Yeah, no, I think I think that's amazing. And we we talked a little bit before the show started about some of the same interests that we have, whether it's you know riding motorcycles or cars or those sorts of things. And you know, I I love old cars. I love cars. Period. Um, my wife will tell you that I don't love cars as much as I love speed, um, which she doesn't really enjoy by the way. But, um, you know, I, am I'm very intrigued by that. I own a, I own a classic mini Cooper, which is my baby. And it's in the, in the shop right now, getting the interior completely redone and, you know, some other things upgraded, so to speak. And so I'm, I'm excited to get it back and be able to drive it. I was hoping to get it back before summer hit because, it doesn't have air conditioning and there's no, <laughs> I've been told by multiple mechanics, if I can figure out how to get air conditioning into a mini Cooper, I would become very, very wealthy because, you know, everybody that owns one would love to have air conditioning in there. But um, I'm excited to get that back and, and uh, get out there and drive. So, I mean, let, let's talk about the car thing. I mean, how, how is it that in your life you came to the point of, you know, you're, you're a fairly young guy and you can tell us how old you are if you, if you want, but, um, you're a fairly young guy to have at one point owned 15 car dealerships. So that, that's very intriguing to me. Tell us about that. Yeah. So <clears throat> I, I'm 38. I, I don't have anything to hide. I'm an open book here, but, uh, I started out actually, I, I was in college in Utah and I was trying to figure out how to pay for college. And so I was, I was waiting tables and doing different things. I've always loved cars. I bought and sold cars since I could drive just so I could get a cooler car because that was a, a, you know, an important thing for me. Back then, it still kind of is now, but you know, kid, family becomes a priority. But uh, so I did that, and I, I actually I started out with one car. I started out with one sixteen hundred dollar nineteen ninety nine Honda Passport. I bought at the auction. That was my first car that I bought at an auction, not from a private party. And got ten minutes out of the auction, and overheated. You know, chalked it up to a learning curve. Figured out it had a bad head gasket. Fit, learned how to fix it. You know, put the money back into myself, and I reinvested in myself, and and I, you know, I sold out of that car. I got my money back out of it, and I went and did it again. And I learned, and I kept doing it and doing it, and I reinvested, and I could, then I got to where I could have two cars, and then I built it up to where I could have ten cars, and then you know, I built my first partnership and kind of grew it from there, and so, you know, it just kept evolving into this thing, and I had this drive to to do that, and then going through college after I graduated. I got to the point in my car sales where I actually couldn't get a job coming out of college that paid me more than I was making doing car sales. So I said, Hey, why do I need to go work for another company? I just stick with this. I love it. It's, you know, fueling my car addiction and I'm having a lot of fun doing it and I'm living a good life. So that's where I just took off and ran. Yeah. I think that, I think that's interesting. You know, I, I actually, uh, I was a missionary for my church back in uh, the late nineties and the the older gentleman that was in charge of the mission, what's called the mission president, um, tried to convince me to open a car lot with him when I got home from being a missionary. And he did that because I actually repossessed cars before I left. And so he thought, you know, when you open a lot like that, and he, he called it a pot lot. I don't know if that's something that, you know, a, a term that you've used before or heard of, but you know, he essentially says it's, it's putting together a, a car lot for people who don't have great credit and a lot of them are paying weekly. And if they don't pay over a certain period of time, then Austin, you're ready to go and, and repossess them. You already know how to do it. So 
I'll put up the money and you start it and we'll, you know, we'll do that. And it, it wasn't interesting to me to, to do that. And so I, I didn't end up taking him up on that, but it is intriguing to, to hear somebody who basically did exactly what he was, he was uh, suggesting that I do. So, yeah. So over what period of time did it take to get to the 15 car lots? And yeah. then tell us what you studied in college, and that may that may tell us why you couldn't find a job that paid more than yeah. <laughs> than what you were making. <laughs> no, I, yeah. So yeah, in college, I, I bounced around. You know, I I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do, which I think a lot of you know students in college, you know, people going to college, they have a lot of pressure to decide. They go, oh, you need to decide what you're going to do, and you feel like you have to get locked into something and take this path for the rest of your life, and. You know, so I bounced around in college thinking, okay, what do I need to go to? What do I need to do? So I was in college probably longer than I should have. And, but I went, I met my wife there, so it was worth it in the end. But, uh, <laughs> you know, that, that's one of the greatest things I took out of college. College is a great experience too. But I was a PR communications major. So that's what I ended up doing. But I was actually pretty cool. I initially went into architecture. I wanted to be an architect. When I started, I worked at an architectural firm. Uh, for three years uh, back in one of my past lives. And you know, I love architecture, but I didn't like where the direction of the business was going because it was changing from kind of that analog to digital where it took some of the creative aspect out of it that I felt like I, I loved and I really resonated with. And it, it became kind of business where a lot of entry-level people uh, might know the new programs and things like that better and changes the d- dynamic of an architect that's been in the business for 40 years and is the experienced, liable party for all these people and you know you have to become a computer a computer nerd essentially and so it yeah. just kind of didn't quite you know jive with me where I was at at that point in my life and so I went on and explored new things and you know, followed the business path and even got into philosophy and I'm you know really close to graduating as an English major and uh, ended up finalizing the or jumping across the uh, finish line in public relations and communication. So hopefully you're not here to take over our job as house of the show, right? No, no, no. I'll leave that to you. You guys are doing a great <laughs> job. All right, Landon, this is your interview to make sure that he doesn't try to take your, your portion as the co-host. Yeah, I better, I better step it up. If I sit here quiet, I'm going to lose my job quick. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's really, really cool to hear how you kind of got started. And uh, I bought some cars from the auction. I've actually bought a few cars from the auction. So, uh, I'm, I'm pretty familiar with that. I didn't, fl- I didn't turn around and flip them, but uh, my experiences have been similar, as, as I'm sure you, you are aware. But uh, let, let's really hope that none of our listeners uh, remember Austin from his repossession days, because uh, <laughs> you might be, uh, you might have some unexpected visitors. Oh man, I but, can tell you some stories. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah. So, Preston. Um, you know, you kind of, you kind of uh, shared with us, you know, kind of what got you started, you know, back then and how you kind of got into what you're doing with the car dealerships. But now, you know, you're a much different person and you've evolved and you've got a lot of new, you know, experiences, trials and tribulations. You've got a family now. So can you spend a couple of minutes and just kind of tell us about, you know, what, what motivates you to do your work these days? Well, you know, I, I like to, think about this story back when I was building my car dealerships. And so, you know, I went from working by myself and, you know, doing everything myself. I bought the car, I cleaned the car, I got it ready. I, you know, priced it I met with the customer. I sold the car. I helped them do the financing. I did all the paperwork and did all the advertising and everything to growing into a company with employees and different things like that. And so I've got a couple different missions, you know, in life. And one of them I've adopted over the past few years in the work in my new renewable energy company and a lot because of a partner, business partner I have, Mark Victor Hansen in that company, who's a famous author of Chicken Soup Soul. And so we're, we're partnering, partners in the energy company. And um, he enrolled me in that mission to make the world work for 100% humanity. But going backwards further through the employee days, you know, it was really inspiring for me to be able to empower someone and to be able to give someone opportunity and provide that opportunity for someone else. And so you know, one of the impactful stories I had in, in my career was with my aunt. I had the opportunity to hire my aunt. I actually employed quite a few people in my family over that time and a number of other people. But uh, one of the stories I share is a story that I had hiring my aunt. And I never, when I was a kid, I never expected to employ you know, the older members of my family, but I had the opportunity to do that. And I was, I was really lucky and blessed and fortunate to be able to do that. But I was able to provide her that opportunity. And she was a mother of five kids. And you know, she had been a stay-at-home mom for a long time. Her husband was a computer programmer and he wasn't getting paid quite enough you know, for what he was doing. And they had some financial issues. They had some debt. You know, they, had a, they had a buildup of debt and they weren't living the life that they wanted to live. And I was able to hire her. I saw something that she didn't see in herself, which was really invigorating and it kind of opened up her life into new possibilities. And I said, Hey, 
you know, Mindy, you're really, really great at talking with people. I want you to come work for my car dealership. She's like, what are you talking about? Because I don't know anything about cars. I was like, look, you can do this. You don't have to know anything about cars. There's just two things you need to do. You need, if, if there's ever a question or a problem, you need to not lie and go find someone that knows the answer and be their friend. And, and if you can do those two things, you're going to be a great car salesperson because all I want you to do is guide this person to find the car that they want. So you don't need to sell them. You just need to be there for them to support them and do that. And so she did it. She jumped into it. And I could see that she had this talent that hadn't ever had the chance to flower in the business environment. And so I was able to bring her into my company and she worked for me and she was just a great, I mean, she's the type of person that, you know, you meet her and she, you'd all feel like she's your aunt. She's just the friendliest person ever. She's, you know, can talk forever and, but you enjoy the conversation. And so and I saw that and experienced that as her family member brought her into the company and she just flourished. She did great. And she's now gone on to do more and more things. And also I, I was able to give them the opportunity to work and to be able to come out of the debt and be able to change their whole family dynamic. She had five kids. These are big kids. Like her son, my cousin, he's like six, eight, you know, and so they're, they, they eat a lot. And you know, when they were trying to get out of the debt, she was living on a budget she budgeted, I think it was like 55 cents per meal for each kid. Oh, and wow. so, you know, to live you know, in that situation and to be able to provide an opportunity for someone to be able to come out of that was one of the most gratifying experiences of my work career. And to be able to see that and to be a part of that and then enable that for someone else. Um, and that was, that's a huge motivating factor. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. I think, you know, I, <laughs> A lot of times the media portrays business owners as these big money hungry people, right? But the reality is most of us who are running small businesses are, are interested in providing employment to people, right? And a lot of times it does end up being your family members. I mean, you're talking about your aunt Mindy and she sounds just like my aunt Renee, who oddly enough works for me, you know? <laughs> and so it's, it's one of those uh, things where, you know, many members of my family have worked for me at different times and, and, but just being able to employ somebody and, and give them a hand up, not a hand out, uh, is, is a huge benefit of being a business owner. Yep. Yeah. And, and to see that happen and to see, you know, I, and that's why I bring up her as a story because I was really connected to her and her family. So I got, I got to see all the effects that came out of it. And, you know, they got to improve their, you know, they got out of their debt and they paid off their debt and then they got nicer cars and then they were able to take their family on vacations and, you know, do more things as a family together. And so, it, it was just a really amazing thing to be a part of. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I shared some statistics last week on the program, you know, about small businesses and, and most people in our country don't realize that 99% of the people in this country work for a small business. Right. And so small business truly is a big business in, in our economy and is super important, which again goes back to why we've, we've put this program out. So, um, I mean, next up, now you've got Operations X. So tell us, you know, tell us a little bit about Operations X, why you started it, where the name came from. And yeah, so Operations X, you know, you know basically, um, you know, Operations X came out of a lot of different business ideas that I had um, coming together and really trying to create a solution for companies and create a solution, you know, for other people. And so Operations X, uh, you know, it, it, how I started it, you know, I was looking at Operations X and X is a multiplier you know, and kind of you look at the different books like, you know, Grant Cardone's 10X or different, you know, things like that. But, you know, I thought if I can multiply people's operations and create exponential growth in other companies, you know, that's something that really excites me and really, you know, wants me, that's something that motivates me to do more. And so I started Operation X and I actually, I started alongside some other different projects too. So, uh, you know, coming out of the car business, I, I got an offer to be a chief operating officer for a renewable energy company called Metamorphosis Energy. And so I took that position, transitioned out of cars, which was great because I got to sleep a little bit more and have a little bit less stress because uh, the car business is crazy, you know, yeah. which it sounds like you might have hit some of those uh, bumps going to the auction land. But, uh, you know, it, it's a wild business. A lot of people think it's easy and they, they jump into it and they go, oh, I'm going to go get into a good deal because I'm going to buy a car at auction. And they realize that there's a lot of technical moving pieces. And it takes a long time to learn and it takes a long time to get good at it. And luckily I was able to do that. But coming out of that, you know, I, I have a lot less stress and a lot less, you know, things happening and moving parts. And so I was able to, you know, work with that energy company. And then also too, with Operations X, um, you know, one of the, one of the things that was a takeaway from my car dealerships is you know, I had my sales team on the ground. I had my, my people on the ground that were you know, servicing the cars and you know, taking care of the pictures and doing things like that. But also, 
I employed people in the Philippines. So I did, I, I call it out staffing. It's kind of a word I made up, but it's like outsourcing. And so, you know, I hired staff in the Philippines and they did all our back end work. So they did in you know, the marketing and those pushes. So you know, my sales team would go home at night. Uh, they, you know, we'd get 300 ads posted in the middle of the night. We'd wake up, all the customers would show up the next day and the salespeople could focus on the customer and they didn't have to do all these other things. And so it allowed me to create a space in my business where I could make it grow and transition through some of those phases that are kind of difficult as a business owner with financial restraints and things like that to be able to keep, you know, hiring people on the ground and growing the sales team and keep the operations affordable as well. So it gave me that balance. And so I, I always wanted in the back of my mind to be able to provide that for other companies. So that, that was one of the components. That's one of the components we do at Operations X. Now I have an office in the Philippines. And so we hire people in the Philippines to be remote workers for U.S. companies here. And so we do it. We take care of all of the you know, ins and outs and ups and downs, the hiring, the firing, the recruiting and everything. And we site manage them. So it's a turnkey employee. We do a flat rate cost and you pay us here so there's no foreign transactions or anything sketchy. And uh, we try and bring quality into the outsourcing, you know, business, basically, that's kind of a, a market gap that's missing right now. So hmm. that that's, you know, one of the things that we've done, that's, it's really fun. And I've kind of grown Operations X from there. And now we're bringing in different solutions to basically help the success of the US business. So that's, that's my mission with that company. Yeah, no, I think that's, I think that's interesting. And, you know, I'm sure all of our listeners have, have heard about people outsourcing to the Philippines for certain things, but I don't know that I've ever thought of a car dealership outsourcing different, um, you know, things to be done in the Philippines. So that's, that's really interesting. So this, I think, is a great opportunity for us to, to give a shout out to one of our sponsors and let them, you know, have a little bit of uh, publicity here to, you know, let us, let us uh, be grateful for what they do for our show. At Pelocity, we deliver more than our awesome product suite with crazy good reviews. We prioritize your success by covering you with a deep support system to back up our easy-to-use, innovative HR solutions. Everything we do is designed to support you in reaching your goals. Together, we tackle your day-to-day -day work so you can spend more time building the culture you and your employees crave. For professionals who crave true partnership, Pelocity is the HR and payroll company that frees you from tasks of today. So together, we can spend more time focused on the promise of tomorrow. Let's go forward together. Awesome. Thank you. So, Preston, just before we uh, move on, I feel like we could talk to you about operations expert for hours. Um, sounds like there's some really, really cool stuff going on there. And I know I know there's more to that story because I, I know you're, you're doing other things for companies, but um, I got to ask, where did the name come from? So, yeah, it, that, well, that was really the, the baseline is just to multiply operations. You know, I, I was, you know, figuring out those operational strategies. And so I, my core is an operational strategist. I'm, I'm just a strategist overall. I love to dive into problems. And that's what you need to be as an entrepreneur is to, you know, be unstoppable, be unshakable and work around solutions because all, all of us entrepreneurs out there, we're solution creators. And so, you know, Operations X was just to, to multiply those operations that people are, are doing and support that. Very cool. Yeah, so you've said this twice now and I actually have it written down because I wanted to quote you. You said uh, in, in some of the texts that you sent us prior to it, you said, provide actionable solutions to help the success rate of us companies which i thought was really cool because that's this this radio show that's what that is built upon is to is to have a platform for small business owners to come on here to tell their stories to inspire other business owners to uh you know do positive things for the economy and for small businesses and um on that note a uh, perfect segue for you to tell us a little bit about this course that you uh, have designed. I would love, love to hear more about that. Yeah, absolutely. So I, you know, recently I had the opportunity to sit down with Mark Victor Hansen and we built a course, what was initially called You Have a Book in You, now we call it You Have a Bestseller in You, because that describes it more even than, uh, you know, what it what initially was. And so you have a bestseller in you, uh, you know, looking at what's happening in the world and what's happening right now, I think we're in kind of the information age. We have so much information at our fingertips. We have so many advertisements popping up. 
there's so many different things happening in the you know, technology and social media and things like that. And so for me, what it really is, is you know, how do you differentiate yourself? How do you differentiate your company? And you know, looking back at my experience, one of the greatest ways we can do that is by telling our story, is by connecting our story to our business or connecting our story to ourself or our brand, or our platform, or whatever it is we're trying to do. Because how does someone know, okay, I want to work with you know, this company or I want to work with this person. And if you have a story that you tell that supports what you do and what you stand for in a business, we often call that something like a mission statement or a vision. And you can tell that story, you can put it into a book and you can use that. And then it's, it's there, it's solid. It's, you know, it's, it keeps on going and it's you know, available for everyone to access and people know what you stand for, what you believe in, what you do, what your purpose is, what drives you. And it creates a deep, deep connection. I had the fortunate opportunity recently to write a book, uh, you know, when, when things got crazy and everyone, you know, kind of went on lockdown. I was in a strategy meeting and I was with uh, Mitzi Purdue. Mitzi Purdue is the owner of Purdue Farms. It's one of the largest chicken companies in the United States. And, uh, you know, we were talking through a meeting and she was coming up with some book ideas and she had some pushback from her legal saying, okay, you know, that that's puts you a little bit of a, she wanted to give some you know advice with COVID-19 to help people, you know, be safe. And they said, you know, it, there's a little bit of a risk there because it, if it doesn't work or it does work, you know, it could put you at some exposure. And I said, well, how about, you know, we do something to help people through isolation. We do something to help people, you know, to live better lives through this and come out of this up on top. And so she loved that idea. And so we got together with Mark and we wrote this book. Uh, it's how to be up and down times. And actually it, we just barely released it uh, today, I think with the new cover. I saw the LinkedIn so, post this yeah, morning. Yeah. yeah. So you know, I, I had the book put together and we redid the uh, cover for the book. And so I haven't been marketing it until today. That was my first you know, post on it. So uh, yeah, I'm really excited about that book because I'm all about creating solutions and people need solutions right now. People are out there, they're struggling, they're having a hard time, they're trying to figure out what's happening, they're trying to figure out how to thrive and survive and do all these things that you know, have become the recent challenge of this year. And so you know, we got together and collaborated on that and I was fortunate enough to be able to do that and, and you know, put that book out really quickly and we hustled on it. And, but you know, now it's out there for the world to hopefully you know, uplift someone else's life. Yeah, I think that's exciting. So I, I, I don't want to cut you off, Landon, so you can jump in if you, if you have something else. But I wanted to ask kind of a follow-up question. You know, you, you've, dro you've name-dropped Mark Victor Hansen already twice on the, on the episode. So I, I would love to know how it is that you came to meet Mark and, and decided to do this together. And then, um, you know, I'll, I'll ask you another question about how the guy down the street who owns the auto shop, for example, and, and convincing him that he's got a bestseller in him and why he should be putting a book out, I think would be yep. interesting. Cause last week's, last week's guest did put a book out. They yep. own, they own a restaurant equipment and maintenance company. And he put a book out called blue is the new white. And it wasn't, it has nothing to do really with their company, but it has to do with the mission of a lack of skilled trades. And so it doesn't necessarily have to be about their company or about, about them, but, I'd love to hear more on those two things. And yeah, well, absolutely. I, I I actually listened to your show last week too, so I heard a little bit about that. And you know, just jumping onto what you're saying there really quickly, you know, he's telling his story, and and a lot of that is their mission. You know, they're employing people. That company that you interviewed last week here, they're employing people that are doing you know labor, hard work, or you know on the on the ground work, and you know those people are needed. And they have a mission in their company to support those people and make a difference and provide opportunity and grow that business and create more. And it, it's this exponential, you know, growth and wealth and opportunity creating. And it, he did that and told his story through a book. And now he, you know, he can use that book to elevate their company and people can read it and they understand, oh, these guys are great. You know, when I have a service guy in my house and they're, or in their, you know, restaurant fixing a, a cooktop or whatever it was they did. Uh, you know, that I know I'm also helping this guy's life, you know, so he's fixing my business and I'm helping him and it creates this connectedness in everything we do. And so that's, that's why I love, you know, the, the seminar and things that you came up with, with the, you have a bestseller in you because it creates that opportunity and how I got connected with Mark is, you know, come, I've, I knew Mark through a couple different ways, but, um, 
you know, Mark, when I was running my car business, Mark was an investor in renewable energy and renewable technologies. So he had been an investor. He sold his chicken soup business in 2008 and had invested in some different technologies. And he always wanted to start a renewable energy company. He saw what I had pulled off in the car business operationally, said, hey, I'd like you to come on. Um, and we're doing a startup with the renewable energy space. I've got some key team members that will be our core, and I'd like you to be our chief operations officer. And so I thought it was a great opportunity. I thought, you know, what a great opportunity to work with such an influential person who's done so much. He's you know, one of the best tellers in world history as far as nonfiction books. And Chicken Soup for the Soul, I think, in most American homes and sure. in a lot of homes around the world as well. So I, it's always in my mind, you know, I, I never, ever, ever want to stop learning. I'm always progressing. I'm always learning. I love to learn every day. So I had that opportunity and I went ahead and took it. It was a big change in my life. Transition ended up moving me down here. Um, I started, you know, a, a contracting company here, started a contracting company in California. We grew it. We got into much different technologies. Uh, I got in introduced to water as well. So energy and water are kind of synergistic. Uh, which brought me into a company I'm involved in called Aqua Research. Uh, they're a humanitarian water company. So they make a water disinfectant generator that's a pocket-sized machine that you can basically create disinfectant and treat the water you have access to. And it doesn't need anything except a little bit of table salt to operate. So it's a really, really cool device. Uh, we do a lot of work with NGOs and things like that to get it around the world to people who don't have access to clean, healthy drinking water. And so I, I was fortunate enough, they asked me to be a board member of that company, working with them. Uh, I, I met them at a, at a uh, actually it was a water conference in Houston where I was speaking at, um, called it Accelerate H2Go, or H2O, hmm. <laughs> H2Go is the product. But uh, yeah, but so yeah, so it's been absolutely, you know, fantastic opportunity to work with Mark. And then now, you know, we collaborate on a bunch of different things. I've helped him throughout his businesses and help him grow some of the things that he's been involved in. And so now we have this new offering with you have a bestseller in you course, and it takes basically over 40 years of his experience and condenses it down into 12 classes so that you can learn how to write a book, market a book and sell the book. And, and a lot of it too is how to make that successful, which a lot of book writing courses and classes don't cover they'll teach you how to write or do different things like that but in the you have a bestseller in you course which is why we put the bestseller part is we really focus on how to bring this to market how to market it how to create licensing opportunities from your book how to create a brand to command that's one of our lessons the brand to command and you know really bring power to your writing and bring power to what you're doing and make it so much more than a book you look at successful speakers or things like that. A lot of them have written a book because they, you know, they write what they like or they write what they know about. People understand that. They resonate with it. And they go, oh, yeah, we want that person now to come talk to us because we know they're an expert in this. I know a local company here, Kaiser Real Estate Group, Jonathan Kaiser, he wrote a book. I know those guys over there. And he, he just wrote his book. Uh, it's like How Not to Be Ruthless or something. I probably screwed that up. Sorry, John. <laughs> but, uh, so he, he wrote a great book. So I read it and it basically talks about an industry problem in real estate and how their company, you know, has, you know, created this space of authenticity and they represent the client or uh, the tenant. And they really try and be, you know, not ruthless and cutthroat and they want to serve the client's needs. And so that's the backbone of his company. And I, I've seen it, you know, since he's released his book. I mean, he has a really big, successful company, but now he's, you know, doing all these things he's in these magazines. And, but what it does when you write a book is it positions you as an expert because you've put down your thought into something. You've put it on paper so that it's there and people understand it. And, you know, you, and then you own it. And so, you know, it just builds that profile. So if you want to elevate yourself as a speaker, if you want to elevate yourself as an expert in anything you do, you can do that. Or, you can use it to do your company like like your friends did last week and say, okay, you know, this is what I stand for and I'm a part of this company. 
this is what we stand for together and it brings it extra depth and it brings it extra you know possibility and creation and connectedness to that company yeah no i i, I see the power behind it i just <clears throat> i wonder if the guy who owns the auto shop down the street is thinking to himself yeah i should write a book right and so you're going to have to convince me. I mean, tell us the website, tell us, you know, whatever we need to do to, to check this out. But I think that those are the guys who there's still a reason for them to write a book. I know it because I've looked into it and I've spent some time researching how that can be powerful to any business period. Um, but I would love to hear you just talk yeah. a little bit more about what, you know, how to convince them, so to speak. No, absolutely. Every, every single little shop store, you know, every shop owner, every business owner, Everyone that's doing something out there, even like a, a little car dealership down the street, you know, whoever owns that car dealership, they've gone through a journey to get where they are and they do it for a reason. And they, there's something there. If they don't see it, maybe it's not obvious to them. They can ask the people around them and see, you know, what they stand for, what drives them, what motivates them, what makes them wake up every day and go to that lot and meet with people that are sometimes people aren't the nicest to car dealerships uh <laughs> it, sometimes car dealerships earn it too I'll go, I'll go, there's two sides to that story it's, True. it's uh you know like lawyers and car dealers and you know get, get a different <laughs> bad rap and but on car dealers there are quite a few car dealers that earn bad rap and we tried to really be honest and be have you know full integrity with um our employees but you know a little tiny shop that you know they have something and it could be a how to how to buy a car book it could be that simple you know because people need help buying cars people need help you know figuring this out it could be how to run a business it could be how to do sales it could be how to manage employees and there's so many different things that you can talk about and i think you know part of that is looking at the problem you know so if we take well in this segue into some event that i have that's coming up too but um, you know, looking at a problem and creating solutions for it. So you, know, you can go out there and I think this is kind of the entrepreneurial spirit and I think it's the backbone of a successful company as well, is to look at problems and go, okay, what, how can I fix that problem? How can I fix that problem as a company? How can I fix that problem as a business owner? And how can I take that and create a solution that someone's gonna buy so that I can turn that into an income so that I can survive by helping others. And so we've got a, a big summit coming up that we just barely put together and it's called Your Finest Hour, Turning Crisis into Opportunity. And so there hasn't, this is the first time I've talked about it. So this is, it, it's coming out. Uh, we're gonna do it the 21st and the 22nd. We've got some huge, huge speakers. So I've got Jeff Hoffman, who's the uh, founder of Priceline and UBID and, and a bunch of other companies got uh, Freddie Ravel, who is you know, from Santana and Earth, Wind and & Fire and a bunch of different music. And he's got some really great inspirational things to talk about. We've got uh, Ken Starr, who was uh, from the Star Report and the, the, back in the Clinton, you know, Monica <laughs> yeah. Lewinsky days right. and things like that. But he's been a, a judge and he's been a really influential person. I've got to know him through uh, some events. I, I was at EarthX and he's just a really great guy. Uh, we've got John Maxwell, who is you know, a leader in, in leadership, you know, and we've just got, you know, we've got a great lineup of people. So, you know, look for that. It's coming out soon. There's nothing out there on the web yet, but it's coming, you know, probably tomorrow. So, uh, you know, we're, we're going to start pushing that out and, and launching that, but, uh, it's, yeah, it's your finest hour. And that goes back to, you know, Winston Churchill quote and turning crisis into opportunity. So it goes back to what I was saying about core of being entrepreneurial is to, you know, take these problems and create solutions. And if you can create a solution for your client, if you can create a solution for your customer, you're creating value that people will pay for. And looking at the crisis right now, crisis equals opportunity. It's kind of that yin and yang of life. And so there's been so much crisis lately. And so we need to collaboratively look at that and go, okay, how do we create opportunity? How do we create solutions from this? You know, what can people do to come out of this and come out of it better and stronger and happier than they were before. And so we've assembled this group. We've got a killer lineup of speakers. It's free. We're giving it away because uh, we want to make a, a better lives across the world. 
And so we encourage everyone, you know, when the posts come out, share it, share it with your friends, watch it. It's going to be a really great, great event. Uh, and, you know, we want to change lives and make a difference and, you know, create opportunity from this crisis or inspire people to do that. Yeah, no, I think that's, I think that's awesome. I mean, here we are, episode two of Tycoons of Small Biz, and we've already got two exclusives from Preston Weeks here in studio today. So he's got the new, the new summit coming out and the new book that launched today. So, you know, we are, we are hosting or co-hosting this program for the first time together. So we're trying to muddle our way through this. I do think this is a good opportunity to hear from our other sponsor. And then because Landon and I are not in the same room, I think I'm going to turn over the rest of the interview to Landon and give him a chance to get uh, involved a little bit more. And we'll have to figure out uh, a better solution for being involved from a distance. Whether you're an established local company or a brand new startup, you can count on GBS to be part of your family. We're not just any benefits consulting firm, we're GBS. We have nearly 30 years of experience in group benefits, a strong sense of purpose, and it shows. GBS, believe in something better. GBSbenefits.com. Yeah, Preston. So, I mean, it sounds like you you are doing a lot for the community, you know, specifically for the small business community. So definitely our hat is off to you, my friend, um, with the summit and the, the book that you just, you know, talked about. Um, just really cool stuff you have going on. Love to hear your thoughts for a couple of minutes on, um, you know, some some advice i know that you said that it's it's all about you know taking these punches as they come in and eventually you know first they the punches are landing and then we learn how to you know we learn how to block them and then we we throw some counter punches right so can you give some some specific advice to the business community you know how how can we come out of this this stronger and take advantage of some opportunities that are in front of us yeah, absolutely. Thanks for asking. So, you know, I'd say, first of all, you know, when we're faced with challenges as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, as someone that's trying to do something, we've got to be unstoppable. We've got to have that persevering attitude to get back up and try again. Because I'll tell you what, you know, I've done a lot of things and I've failed at a lot of things and I've learned more from my failures than I have my successes. And so, you know, if we can look at what's happening and get back up and figure out how to do it again better, that makes us, you know, that much stronger. The second part of that is fear. You know, I think there's a lot of fear that's out there today mm -hmm. and a lot of fear that's out there in the world. You know, I don't even like to really watch the news that much. I mean, I watch a little bit, you know, try and keep up on what's happening in the world, but uh, it, and I'm probably on the extreme end of things and we don't even have cable in our house. I've got Netflix and Hulu and all those streaming things, but, uh, yeah. So, you know, I, I, but there, a lot of the news is negative. A lot of the news is negative out there. And, and there's a lot of this fear based mentality that's going around in society today. And so we need to overcome the fear. We need to realize we're smart enough. We're good enough. We can do this. People are great. And if, if you can't do it, you know, I think collaboration is huge. You know, if you look at like one and one, if you hold your fingers together, it makes 11. And, you know, I've heard that quote before. It's not mine, but you know, it's like two flames coming together. It makes, you know, this exponential growth, this big flame. You know, we need to come together and we need to overcome this fear and have a positive you know, outcome, a positive mental attitude so that we're, we don't go down. We can't, you know, we have to be unstoppable. We have to overcome the fear. And then the third part of that, I would say, is to look for solutions. You know, I, I'm a reverse engineer. I'm a professional reverse engineer. Start at the end. You know, that's another you know, one of our lessons in our book writing course is start at the end. And so, you know, I, I like to reverse engineer everything because if I don't know where I'm going, how am I going to get there? And so if we start at the end, look for solutions and go, how do I get to that point? How do I get to where I want to be? How do I get to what I want? How do I get to that solution that someone needs today? And there's so many out there. So if we keep our head up and we're looking out and we're open and optimistic that we can find those solutions, we can get there. Yeah, absolutely. I was talking with a client on Friday afternoon at about uh, 4.30, just kind of wrapping up my day. 
and um, they're uh, new newer clients. I've uh, known them forever, but the newer clients to uh, to our practice. And um, we were kind of catching up. You know, hadn't talked in about a month because of the you know the twins coming and stuff. And it was so inspiring to listen to them and their approach to this because you know their their business has been hit. I mean, really hard, you know, I think at one point their revenues were down about 50 to 70%. And to listen, it's a husband and wife, and to listen to her tell about what she is doing. She, you know, increased her marketing budget and she, uh, you know, they've gone above and beyond to ensure that their, their locations are professionally sterilized and clean. And they've, you know, they've kept you know, all their, their staff on and they've just, I mean, it's just incredible to hear what some of the business owners are doing out here, you know, in the community to ensure that they come out of this stronger because what's going on right now, it's, it's really going to define a lot of us as business owners. I mean, this either, it's not going to solve down, but you know, what do we do? Do we, are we going to get up and are we going to persevere or are we going to, stay down and, and, you know, shut the doors and, and go back to a, uh, you know, to a corporate job. So I think just the advice and the, the, the programs and everything you're doing is just uh, so relevant and, and just appreciate it. Um, but just kind of, as we, as we get to the end of this interview, um, would love to hear your thoughts on, uh, you know, where do you see, you know, the, the business world, you know, as we, as we start to come out of this, you know, this health pandemic, what are your, what are your, your, your thoughts as to, as to that? And, and where do we, where do we go from here as a business community? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, a lot of that is, it starts with change, you know, things you now coming out of this, you can't look to the past to see what's happened to figure out what's going to happen in the future now. We've got to rethink this. We've got to look at it. We've got to be observant and look at trends that are happening. And a lot of these business owners, one of the things I think that are going to come out of this, obviously, is remote work. So a lot of these companies have been forced into a, you know, adopting the remote work model. And, uh, and they either decided, oh, this is terrible. Or they hate it. I'm never going to do this again. It didn't work for my company. But there's a huge, huge portion of those companies that are going to go, this was great. My employees are happier. Uh, you know, they're getting more done. They don't have to commute. They don't have to, you know, waste time. You know, they're more comfortable in their houses and doing different things like that. And they don't want to come into the office. And so I don't have to buy an office. I don't have to spend the money on the real estate. I don't have to you know, provide desks and do all these things that are huge operating expenses for owners. Or if you're a startup and you're trying to be a lean startup, you can use that model now and go, okay, now I don't have to pay for an office. Now I don't have to have a $3,000, you know, lease. In a, in a place where I can bring you know, customer to or put my employee base in, I can take what I've learned from this and come out of it on top and use the different avenues that are gonna be there for remote work and things like that. And so, you know, I think that's, that's one of the big ones that's gonna come out of this. And you know, we've learned a lot also too, as far as the opportunities that come around that are, are solutions. There's an endless sea of solutions that people can provide as business opportunities now to support companies to be successful in that. And then you look at, you know, other trends, like I think, you know, a lot of, it'll be interesting. There's going to be a lot of pivots in companies. I think big companies on the manufacturing and production side are, are going to be looking at things like AI and robotics to go, shoot, we just had our facility shut down because our employees got sick and we lost, you know, $200 million. Let's put $400 million into robotics and cobotics and take that and put it on a production floor so we never have this happen again. And so what that looks like in the workspace too, and I, I, some people don't like that, some people fear that. I think you know, we can adapt and learn. And I think a lot of possibilities will come out of that, a lot of uh, creativity and different opportunities will come out of that, that people can come in and fulfill and you know, support the things that are happening around that. You look at the supply chain, you look at distribution, you look at you know, US manufacturing needs to increase. You know, we, we've exposed a ton of volatility in our medical system, in our supply chain. And, you know, we need to bring back production to the United States. We need to bring things here so that we have control of it. And we're not at the mercy of, you know, some other government. It, without getting, you know, political or anything on it, 
to just say, look, you know, we want control of this. We want control and we want to be able to support our people. So if we, you know, can be creative to go, okay, you know, if we sent, if we had production in China before, because it was a cost factor, bring AI, bring, you know, robotics back here, have people build plants here, build the U S economy and, you know, have that production here. And, we can create managers and create more opportunity and create more jobs here for people to have and people to grow and people to do things with. So those are just a couple of the things that, you know, I've got, but yeah, there's a, there's a lot of changes. So my advice is keep your head up, you know, watch what's happening because it's, it's going to move fast. And with AI and 5g and, you know, all the different technological advances, I think in the next 10 years, life's going to change faster than it's ever changed before. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, before I kick it back to Austin to kind of wrap things up, Preston, I know there's, there's going to be people that want to, they want to track you down and want to learn more about all these opportunities that you've presented to the listeners. So where do we, where do we find you? What's the easiest way to track you down? Yeah. So, well, I mean, anyone can reach out to me on LinkedIn, just Preston Weeks, W E E K E S. It's uh, I think like my uh, hash, my uh, back end LinkedIn thing is energy guy, but um operations x it's operations plural with the letter x OperationsX.com. you can go on there check us out see what we're doing we're here to support businesses we do consulting you know i i consult a lot of different ceos i work with to help to navigate the problems and the trials and the challenges and the pivots that are happening in the world right now today and so we can be a resource we can help you we can get through this if you've got a story to tell check it out OperationsX.com. go to the products page you can see my new book it's there you can see our new course. You have a bestseller new course and tell your story, separate yourself from the herd and have people know what you stand for and make a difference and elevate your company. And I can help you do that if you want. And, uh, or, you know, I just, I just want everyone to do it. Whether they come to me or not, I want everyone to succeed and I want everyone to do better because it, it creates a you know, better society for everyone. Awesome. We appreciate you. Yeah, no, and I'm just going to jump in real quick and, and, you know, just talk about a post that I made on, uh, I don't know if it was LinkedIn or Instagram or whatever, a few weeks ago, and somebody direct messaged me and, and kind of asked me what I thought the future looked like, right? And, you know, I, I think he was expecting that I would give some sort of investment advice. And, and the point was, here's what I know. I don't, I don't know what the future holds. I don't know how much COVID-19 is going to change, but it is going to change the way that we look at things. And what I know is that employers and innovators are going to figure it out. If you, if you give innovators and employers an opportunity to figure out a way to, to dig out of this, they will figure out a way. Does that mean that there won't be some businesses that just, just are not able to make it through this? There, there will be some businesses, and, and it may be as high as 25% of the small businesses in America that just won't recover from this. And that's the sad, sad part of, of what we just came through. But what I do know is that those who, and I think it might have been Landon who mentioned one of his clients that, that doubled down on marketing, that, you know, one of the big messages we learned from you today is lifelong learning, right? Mm -hmm. So if you take the, the opportunity to learn and grow from this and adapt and do things differently going forward, a lot of things are born out of crisis, right? A lot of big, big successes are born out of crisis. And so if we take the opportunity to take a step back learn, do what we can do to come out of this. I'm the one thing that I will always bet on is the American business owner. And, you know, I heard on the radio last, last week that to call the, the small business owners in America, the backbone of America is not enough, right? I mean, it's, it's more than that. It, it truly is. It's the small businesses. You know, we, we're all small business owners in this room. It's up to us to drive this economy forward. And I would bet on the, the listeners of this show and I would bet on each of us in this room to figure it out. And, yep. and it's up to us to make sure that we do that. Yeah, maybe we should change that to the skeletal structure of America. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> All, uh, what is it, 212 <laughs> bones in the American body? Yeah, or I mean, in the human body. So yeah, no, I, I really appreciate you being on, Preston. I, I think your story is is very innovative and I think that it, uh, you know, it inspires all of us to, to realize that there is always more that we can do. So we, we appreciate you being in studio today and, and uh, 
once again, I just want to give a quick shout out to our sponsors. We couldn't do this show without them. GBS and Paylocity, they're fantastic partners of ours. If you don't know who they are, please look them up online. They are, they are fantastic partners to small business throughout this country. Thanks a lot, Preston. Thanks for having me. Our pleasure. <laughs>
manufactured in the 70s, probably mid 70s. I've been riding since I was three. So I had my first three wheeler and it, it was a, you know, the old, I call it chubby. It was a red, you know, Honda 70. And uh, I haven't oh, yeah. off since. So yeah, yeah if we you, had three wheelers too on the farm. Yeah. yeah. If you are comfortable standing you know, on yeah. either side, I'd like to get a shot of you guys with Landon in between there. This is Landon's time to shine. Yeah. A little scary full screen. <laughs> <laughs> Should I put my arms up like I'm, you know, around them? There you go. Yeah, do a fun one like that. Ah, crazy. One more. That's cute. Uh, and now just a smiling one, come in a little bit tighter. Okay. All right, one, two, three. And again. Nice. All right, headsets on until Landon can hear you. I'll let you guys say goodbye. All right. Take your time, no rush. <clears throat> All right, sir. <laughs> well, we'll have to work out the logistics a little bit better, I think, because it's I got to make sure that you know, you know, when it's your turn to talk or me not talking over you. And cause there's a little bit of a delay with you coming in. So I'm never quite sure if you're going to say something. So we'll have to work on that, but yeah. Yeah. You know, and it'll just take a little bit of time, but we'll, we'll figure that out quickly. I'm, I'm sure of it. Yeah. Well, it was pretty darn smooth considering, I don't know if, yeah. I, yeah. First time I've watched the two of you together and I thought you did really well. First time out of the gate. And it, it is a little bit harder with you on the screen. Uh, but I, no one will be, no one will be aware because it was pretty darn good. Yeah. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah. I had a little bit of, I, I, I actually lost you guys probably twice for about five to 15 seconds. Oh. Um, so I didn't say anything because I was, I was just crossing my fingers that I would get reconnected and I did, but, um, yeah, I did lose you guys just once or twice, but I think it, I think it worked out just fine. You gotta tell your wife to quit watching Netflix while you're on. I'm, you know what? I'm actually I'm actually at my office right now because if I would have been at, if I would have been at home, you know, we we've got a, a two year old golden doodle puppy and oh yeah, 